Hey everyone, it's Dewey again. I know it's been a while since I had any uh, videos out that uh, has any flying or anything like that. And sorry about the corporate flying stuff. I, uh, I'm still on IOE with the Challenger and I just can't be training and, and doing videos at the same time. But today we have a treat for you. We have the $1 Pete and Pole right behind me. Andrew King is gonna be uh, doing all the narrations and we're gonna be flying the airplane. It's a uh, Moto A powered. Uh, 40 horse Pete and Pole. It's the oldest Pete and Pole air camper in the world flying. So, uh, you guys make sure you hit the subscribe button, likes, uh, leave some comments, but really appreciate it. Uh, my YouTube base is building up. Let's keep building it up, get higher and higher. And eventually, we get the new standard. You guys can see the travel air in the background. And I have my champ. So, eventually, we're going to have a lot of cool stuff. I, hopefully I'll have some time to do it but uh, barnstorming season has been really busy and I just haven't had time to really put a lot of videos together but here you guys go hope you guys enjoy enjoy mr. Andrew King this is the hardest part about flying it is getting in I think Ed Russert was probably five foot six I'm six two and a half that was Ed Russert a little skinnier <laughs> not to say that you're fat <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you have to hand prop this thing with no brakes. Hey, this is Andrew King. He's going to talk about the Pete and Pole here. All right, this is the oldest flying Pete and Paul air camper in the world. There's a Pete and Paul Sky Scout, which was a one seat version that's a little bit earlier than this one that's flying in Australia, actually. But this is the oldest two seat air camper, which is the most common type of uh, Pete and Pauls. Uh, Bernard Pete and Paul lived in Minnesota in the 20s. He wanted to design an airplane that anybody could afford. And so this was this was the result of it and the genius of it is people are still building them because people can still afford to build them uh the, his big thing was to build an airplane that used a car engine because an airplane engine was like fifteen hundred dollars and people were fifteen hundred dollars a year was a good wage in 1929 so uh nobody could afford an airplane engine except just if you were really well off but uh you could buy a brand new model a ford engine i think for like 50 bucks or 75 bucks so people could actually afford it so Pete and Paul figured if he could build an airplane that would use a Model A Ford engine, then people could afford to have these airplanes and fly them. And, and, and in fact, it worked. But uh, uh, So this is a Model A Ford engine. It's been modified a little bit. Uh, the oil system, there's some extra oil lines here for the oil system to put pressure oil to the main bearings. Uh, it's got a high compression cylinder head on it for a little bit more horsepower. The stock one is 40 horsepower. This one is probably... 45, 48, somewhere around there, I, I'm just guessing. Uh, this is the rear of the engine in the car, is the front of the engine in the airplane. And uh, so this would be the front, it has the fan belt and stuff, runs a water pump up here. The radiator is mounted up on the top. Uh, it it kind of blocks the pilot's vision a little bit, although you can lean around, you can lean out and see around it. But it, the theory was that if the water pump failed, it would thermosiphon, they call it, where the hot water here naturally goes up into the radiator, it cools down, it comes back, and so it still circulates even if your water pump fails. So that's one of the reasons they put the radiator up on top. The airplane itself was built in 1934. Come around to the side here. I think it first flew in August, 1934. 
these are some pictures of what it looked like early in its life. We think this is Ed Russert, the guy who built it in Minnesota in 1934. You can see it had different wheels and tires on it. And it was black when it was new. And then it was later in 1941, we think, repainted red. Uh, so we still have it red. Ed Russert, who we think this is, he built the airplane. I think, he, I think his brother helped, and they were in Minnesota. He flew it for a while. Eventually, they sold it to a flying club that was run by Bernard Pete and Paul himself. And so the airplane was partially owned and was flown by Bernard Pete and Paul himself, which is a, which is a very historic thing. Uh, we think this is a picture of it during that time. This is a guy named Emerson Finke, who was a good friend of Bernard Pete and Paul's. It has the fat tires on it now. They put the fat tires on it. A little bit less stress on the airplane with the fat tires. And they had it for less than two years, I think. And there's a famous story about two of the guys in the flying club got kicked out of a tavern for being drunk one night. They took this airplane. They, at night, flew it to the tavern with eggs and egg bombed the tavern. But it was at night. They couldn't see what they were doing, really. They were some, probably still drunk. Apparently, they flew through the top of a tree and damaged the landing gear, and Bernard Pete and Paul got angry and said, that's it, that's the end of the flying club. And we went to Minnesota 10 or 15 years ago, and Bernard Pete and Paul's son drove us around, and he showed us the tree that it hit when, at the time. But uh, So Bernard Pete and Paul decided to dissolve the flying club. They're going to sell the airplane. They sold it to Alan Rudolph. This is a picture of Alan Rudolph. He bought this airplane in 1941, January 1941, and he owned it till 1995. So 54 years, Alan had this airplane. He took it to all the fly-ins. It was at the first antique fly-in at Otomwa. It was at the first EAA fly-in at Oshkosh when they when they used to go to different uh, cities or towns every year with, with the fly-in. Uh, Steve Whitman has apparently flown it. Uh, Paul Pobresny, who founded the EAA, has flown it. Uh, we try to let, if we have a friend who's who's good enough to fly it and appreciates it, we try to let other people fly it, and that there's been dozens of people who have flown it in the last few years. Uh, and we figured the kind of the mission of the airplane is to let people experience 1934. It's probably 98% original. The fabric, of course, is new. Uh, the tires are new. A few other little things are new. The engine is a different engine. We had a, the, the original engine uh, got left with water in it one winter and, and froze and cracked. Uh, the coolant when it expands, of course, it'll crack the block and it crack. But we have the block. We're hoping to actually repair the original block and uh, get as much of the original engine as possible rebuilt and back into the airplane. But uh, for instance, this stuff now, this this little bit different color green here and the stuff around the front cockpit, this is apparently material from Ed Russert's old couch. And when he was building the airplane, he cut up the material off the cushions of his couch and used it for the cockpit combing. Uh, the rear cockpit ones got worn out from people climbing in and out so much. So Frank Pavliga, who did a lot of work on the airplane, uh, he, repla he he spent a couple of years searching for something that was close to this and replaced these three pieces in the back. But this is still from Ed Russert's couch from 1934, and all the front ones are from Ed Russert's couch from 1934. Uh, one of the kind of well-known in the aviation world aspects of the airplane is that... Uh, in 1995, Alan was, I think he was 95 years old, something like that. He couldn't fly anymore. He'd lost his medical. Uh, a bunch of friends of his got together and, and fixed the airplane. Jim Hammond, uh, Ted Davis, Dick Alkire, uh, a bunch of guys got together and they recovered the airplane and fixed up the airplane and made it fly again. And Alan got to fly in it one last time with Ted Davis at Broadhead, Wisconsin. Uh, Ted went up and let Alan fly it around a little bit and uh, he got to fly it one last time. And then he told Ted that he wanted to sell the airplane. And Ted uh, said, well, my friend Jim will buy it. And so he called up Jim and said, hey, you just bought a Pete and Paul. And uh, apparently Jim said, how much did I pay? <laughs> so, <laughs> but Jim was, was fortunately up for it and was a good guy to own it, and he owned it for a while. And then Jim uh, decided to sell it to Ted. Uh, this was around, I think, 2002 or 2003, something like that. Uh, Jim sold it to Ted for a dollar. And the provision was that Ted could have it and fly it for a while and treat it as his own. And when he decided he was done with it, he had to sell it to Frank Pavliga for a dollar, uh, which happened about 10 years ago or so. And the same deal for Frank. He could keep it for a while and fly it as he wanted and do what he wanted with it. And then when he was done with it, he had to sell it to me for a dollar. 
And so on September 9th this year, I think it's the 25th today, a few weeks ago, uh, we did the deal and I gave him actually a dollar one. I get, added an extra penny in the change to see if he'd count it, which he didn't count it. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, I gave him his dollar and uh, he gave me a bill of sale. And so uh, so now I'm the, I'm the caretaker of it. And uh, we like the interesting history. So uh, that'd be a good, uh, a good blog here at the Dewey Drone. <laughs> This is, this is a carb heat muff. Uh, the Model A's do have quite a tendency to ice, and so they put this little muff on here, takes hot air from this front exhaust stack and puts it right into the carburetor. Now, most modern airplanes, of course, they do have carburetor heat, but they have an on-off valve, so you can run it cold because you get more power uh, when you're running it cold, but it doesn't rob enough power that it's worth the weight and complexity of putting a valve on there. When the airplane is flying, if there's any humidity, you'll see water form on the intake manifold which is kind of interesting. And sometimes drops will come back and hit you in the face, but it's, it's normal. I've never had this airplane ice. I have had Model A Fords in Pete and Paul's ice up and quit, but, uh, but not this airplane. And this is a standard Pete and Paul thing, having this, sometimes they use a tomato soup can and, and cut it, cut holes in it and stuff to make it, uh, to make the heat muff. But that's, that's a standard setup. The other interesting thing about the operation of the engine is it's single ignition. Uh, all modern airplanes are dual ignition with redundant, with two magnetos. This is one of the modifications that was made to make this from a car engine to an airplane engine. They put an adapter on the back of the engine. It's hard to see, but they mounted a magneto on the back of the engine. And so, but, it, but it's single ignition, only one magneto, which is unusual for an airplane. Oh, okay. I see it down there now. If you guys can see that, there's the magneto. And there's a, looks like some kind of drive you guys made there. Yep, it drives off the back of the crankshaft. Okay. So huh. I'm going to take it around the patch a couple times, and then we're going to put Dewey in it. Uh-oh. That's scary. That's going to be a vlog to remember. Let me pull it out. Oh, while you're there, here's another thing we want to point out. The airplane has no brakes, and so it has a tail skid on the back that just drags in the ground, which means you have to land on grass. You can't really land on pavement. If the, if the wind is right down the runway, you could land it on pavement, but... Uh, but basically, you have to land it on grass because of the tail skid. You guys can see here, here's the elevator, uh, control cable, the rudder. And see, they put leather here so it doesn't wear out. This is all just spruce. And this is spruce also. And what else is this thing made out of? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's largely spruce. Most of it is spruce. You can see in the cockpit there, the I think they're one inch by one inch spruce pieces that make up the basic framework and then there's uh, uh, maybe spruce plywood. Nowadays you can't get spruce plywood. It would be mahogany plywood probably nowadays, but that may be original spruce plywood uh, covering the sides back to the cockpit and then it's an open truss from the cockpit back. Uh, the instruments, we'll look at the instruments. Whoops. Uh, this is an old-fashioned bubble inclinometer, of course. Again, pretty rare. That's oil pressure. The oil pressure gauge is at zero now, even though it says, I think, six. It's, uh, it's, it's always been stuck there at zero. When you start it up the very first time, it goes right to the peg. And after it warms up a little bit, it'll come back to about eight, which is about two PSI, which is all it runs. It's normal for a Model A Ford engine to run about two or three PSI. And so as long as it's showing above the six, you're okay. Altimeter, an old-fashioned Zenith altimeter. We think all these instruments are original from Ed Russert from 1934. Uh, airspeed indicator. Uh, I'm not sure what the good luck medallion is. I think it's a St. Christopher thing. And I'm not sure if uh, Alan had that in there, certainly. I don't know if that's from Ed Russert or from Alan. This is a magneto switch. It's a, It may be out of an old Cub or take Taylor Craft or something. Uh, but it's for two mags, which we only have one. So off is to the left honest in the middle and it's off again the other way so you have to make sure it's straight up and down if you want the switch on that's an original tachometer the engine that we have in it now was set up for an electronic tack and so we don't have the drive so this isn't working but frank made up this nifty fold out electronic tack so we can see what the engine is doing when we want to but we can still hide it away so you can't see it and then the temperature gauge over here the temperature should run about 160, 170 most of the time. Uh, uh, the radiator works pretty good, and so that's that. Here's a control stick. I, I think that hand, that grip on that control stick, I think, is the same one that Ed Russert and and Ru and uh, Alan Rudolph and Bernard Petenfall grabbed onto when they were flying the airplane. 
and then there's a rudder bar for your feet instead of pedals. It's like the like the front of a sleigh uh, to work the rudder. Boy, original seat belts. These are original Jenny style seat belts. Kind of a odd looking buckle there, but those are the original seat belts. And there is a seat in the front now. I weigh about 235 pounds, and of course, people back in 1934, the average person was probably 150 or 160. So I act, I don't take passengers in it, but we do have we have a friend, Chris Price, who's light enough, and and he's taken passengers in, it. and Ted's taken passengers in it. It would do it, but uh, but I prefer to have the extra performance and and just go by myself. You guys can see this seat. It's just about 12 inches by 12 inches plywood no cushions or anything like that and then the rudder bar you see the rudder bar coming out on the side so andrew's feet will be right there moving back and forth you guys can see that pretty interesting dual controls though rudder uh, rudder pedals control stick